Hey guys, Patrick Coca here, part of your Midtown family. We're in Soda City Market on this blistering hot day, talking to people about the Ten Commandments and moral code. So Abigail, would you say you have a moral code? Yeah, I definitely do. What would that code be? Um, well, I'm a big Christian, so just a lot of it is just based on the Bible and just like treat others with kindness and how like Jesus taught people. Would you say that you have a moral code? Absolutely, yeah. And where does that moral code come from? Uh, elementary school teachers, they taught you, you know, treat others how you want to be treated. My mom already reiterated it to me when I was younger, so that's just something that I always live by. Would you say you have a moral code that you live by? Um, not something that I think about quite often, but I'm sure I kind of do. I try to live as a nice person, at least. I mean, I'm a Christian, but like, I just believe that the Bible is just, it's been interpreted so many times, so sometimes it's hard, like, you just pick and choose sometimes, so it's, it's really up to like what that person believes. Would you say you live by a moral code? Um, somewhat, you know, somewhat. Yeah. Where would you say that code comes from? Um, probably half the way I was raised and half, you know, world experience, you know, seeing how to treat people, I guess. I kind of go with the flow a little bit. I definitely have morals, but it's a little bit more situational. I don't necessarily think that it's all black and white, I guess. How I'm raised is a part of it, and also just like ex life experiences, um, as well as just thinking about how I'd like to be treated by others. Um, I try and do the, like the golden rule type thing, treat others like you want to be treated yourself. Well, good morning, how are we today? Y'all awake this morning? All right. Uh, yes, I heard, I heard a few yeses, good. Uh, welcome, my name is Brandon. If I haven't met you yet, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, in our series for the fall, we're studying the Ten Commandments. And before we talk about each one of them individually, we're taking a few weeks to talk about them as a group. Um, you guys ready to have some fun today? Yeah. yeah? Did y'all bring your thinking caps? I hope so. I hope you got some good sleep last night and brought your thinking caps. All right, let's get to it. Uh, if you were in one of these street videos and you were asked to write your own Ten Commandments. I'm curious, what would your list be? I know that we're Christians, most of us are anyway, and we're a church, so, and you're here, so you're gonna say, I'd keep the ones God wrote. Yes, that's the correct answer. Uh, but just as a thought experiment, experiment, do this with me. For what, what are the things that seem really important to you? What would your list of the most important 10 moral commands be? And what do you think the average modern American would say as their list? Uh, one thing we found from the interviews and that showed up in this video is that people do have a moral code. They might not be able to articulate it clearly. In fact, usually they can't because it's not something that we think about a lot, or at least not overtly. But we are always making moral judgments about what we should or should not do, what others should or should not do. So it's pretty important to know what's underneath them. This is the reason why, for example, online, you see certain things that just absolutely infuriate you. You cannot believe someone is saying something so ridiculous. That's because it goes against your innate sense of morality, which is what the Bible calls your conscience. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 2. We're going to uh, look at uh, what Paul has to say about our consciences and continue the conversation today by hopefully giving us some biblical language and categories for all this. We're actually going to start and end with Romans. And in the middle, I hope to give you some categories to understand why God has different morals than we do sometimes. So starting in Romans 2, uh, we'll look at verses 14 through 16. He says, For when Gentiles, uh, the non-Jewish people who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts innately, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So Paul here brings up the concept of conscience, this is spelled out in the book that we published to go along with this series as well because it's critical for our discussion. 
So a few points here. Number one is you have a conscience. The argument Paul makes here is simple. When people who don't have access to the law of God by nature sometimes do some of the things the law calls for, it shows that the work of the law is written on our hearts, as Paul says. God hardwired into you this innate tendency to discern between right and wrong. When you were little and you realized that it was kind of fun to pick on other kids at school, but it also made you feel bad when you saw the hurt on their face, that's your conscience. This is an important part of how God made you. You were made with an an onboard morality detector. It doesn't always keep you from doing what's wrong, but it's always there functioning to some degree. It doesn't determine right and wrong, but it serves as a warning system. Two, your conscience is affected by your sin nature. It's marred by your sin nature. Paul says that our conscience has conflicting thoughts. It's not at all settled on God's design because it's broken by sin. He goes on to argue in Romans 2 and 3 that Gentiles or non-Jewish people still need access to God's law because it shows us all the ways we're wrong. It shows our need for forgiveness by God and salvation by trusting Christ. So although our conscience functions to a certain degree, it is not at all an ultimately trustworthy source of determining right from wrong. Uh, Consider this metaphor for our consciences. Uh, They're a bit like a metal detector that fell out of a truck going down the highway. You try to use that thing and it's gonna be messed up, right? It's gonna be messed up. It still beeps sometimes when you put it near metal, but then sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it beeps when there's nothing metal nearby. That's the effect that sin has on our consciences. It, It might lead you to believe that things are not acceptable to God, which actually are totally fine, or that things that are acceptable to God are wrong. Jeremiah 17 says that our heart or our gut is sick. So this broken conscience, especially when shaped by culture, is why you can say or think things like, I know that God says it's wrong, but I don't feel conviction for it at all. That's because your conscience is broken by sin. That does not mean God is wrong. But sin isn't the only thing that affects your conscience. Number three, your conscience is shaped by your culture. So do you know that you would think about the world very differently if you would have been born into a different culture than ours? I got started to realize this a while back when I figured out the things that we as Western Americans find difficult in the Bible are not at all universal. That's fascinating to me. Like in our culture, the idea that God has wrath on those who rebel against him is really, really tough. People are like, how is that okay? But if we were missionaries in some parts of the Middle East right now, they would have no problem with that. They would have a problem with grace. They would be like, wait a minute, God forgives people, like evil, immoral people, when they haven't done anything to earn it? No way, I cannot accept that. This is why different letters to the churches in the New Testament have different corrections because those groups have gotten off in a particular way. There are certain areas of your conscience that have been shaped by your culture and the people around you, and you may not even know it. So there's a category for something that is so normative in your culture that it feels like there's no way that this is sinful. When you could actually be mistaken, you were just so desensitized to it that you couldn't see it. And every culture has blind spots that tend to get passed on to the individuals living there. This is a big concept for our series. And the power of a culture to shape conscience is easiest to see in the negative extremes. Like somehow modern Western people literally less than a century ago got caught up in Hitler's Nazi regime, including a belief system but that believed the best thing for the world was to exterminate an entire race of people. And somehow they reconciled that with their conscience. Let that sink in for just a second. They, they weren't like, we know this is pure evil, but who cares? They reasoned themselves there. Going back further in history, our forefathers somehow came to the conclusion that it was justifiable to kidnap millions of people from Africa and bring them over here to forcefully enslave them and build our new country. In the ancient Middle East, at the time the Ten Commandments were given, other surrounding nations worshipped a god called Molech, and they would actually take their firstborn children to him and burn them to death on this statue, believing they would receive a better life because of their sacrifice. And just to be clear, if you hear all of that and you think, 
yeah, everyone who came before us was so evil and stupid. You're not listening. This should be terrifying for all of us that we can have blind spots even that large. It makes you think what future generations might look back on us and say, how do they not see it? It's very, very difficult to see the cracks in your own culture's collective conscience. In the book that we published for this series, we call the, the dominant views of our culture secularism, just for simplicity's sake. The word secular simply means non-religious. Since our country is not a theocracy, we have a wide range of people and thoughts about morality. And over time, certain ways of thinking become prioritized. It's like this crowdsourced thinking about right and wrong where you intuitively begin to sense, if I want to fit in here, I better think this way. So when I say secular, I just mean the collective moral thinking that comes from educated, culturally savvy, non-religious people here. And the way God's vision of morality conflicts with our particular culture is going to be very unique to us, just like it is to every other culture. And I know you might not use the word conscience much. That's not a word we use on the street very much. I often hear people talking about going with their gut or doing what seemed right. That's actually about our conscience. And what I'm trying to tell you is that your gut isn't neutral that your common sense would not be common to most people who've ever lived. It has been shaped by living here now in powerful ways. One of my favorite examples of this and how powerful our surroundings can be is, is the story, The Emperor's New Clothes, right? The Hans Christian Andersen short story, if you have read it, where everyone wants to be seen as an upstanding citizen and be upper class, so they act like the emperor is wearing clothes even though he's not until a little child finally says, but the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> like, what are we doing? And if we, rightly so, want God to forcefully confront Hitler and slave traders and people who burned their firstborn and the Taliban, then he has to be able to confront us too, right? He has to be able to confront us too. And the things we just aren't willing to see because seeing them would have too high of a social cost. There are times where he's going to step in and say, you are not wearing any clothes on that issue. So you have a conscience. Your conscience is marred by sin. Your culture affects your conscience. Each of those three, three things are at play when you're making day-to-day -day decisions about how you should live, what's okay and what's not okay. And those three things also affect the way you approach an authoritative list of moral commands like the Ten Commandments. They shape how you see them. So we will again look at Deuteronomy 5 at the imperative portions of these commands for today. You can flip there or you can follow along on the screen with me. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 7, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the Lord, name of the Lord your God in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet. So for the average non-Christian person in America today, here's how I would, I would imagine this list of Ten Commandments might strike them. A few of them would stand out as really important, like don't murder. We should keep that one, right? That one's pretty good. Don't steal also seems pretty great. It's awful when someone steals your stuff. A second category might be things that are thought as okay, but certainly not top 10 material for secular culture. Things like honor your father and mother? Eh, maybe. Depends on a ton of factors. Don't covet? I mean, jealousy is bad, but it's not that bad. Observe the Sabbath. I mean, I like a good day off, don't get me wrong, but I definitely don't want to think about God on that day off. Like self-care day, bro, okay? Brunch, mimosa, lake. 
Don't bring God into this. A third category would be total head scratchers. Many wouldn't even understand where they're coming from. Things like, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Why not? What does that even mean? You shall not make for yourself a carved image, bow down, or serve them? I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. You lost me. No clue. So out of this list, a few would make a lot of intuitive sense to us here, and others would be real head scratchers. And to explain why I believe this is the case, I want to do some cultural analysis for a bit, and I'm going to bombard you with some concepts, but if you'll hang with me, and especially if you read along in the book we published uh, to catch what I don't have time for, I think it could be helpful for you understanding the Bible more and understanding our culture a bit more, and potentially giving some categories for things in Scripture that were previously very confusing. And a tangential benefit could include going, oh, about some of the political disagreements in our our country. So I want to give you some categories for morality. These categories come from a professor and moral psychologist named Jonathan Haidt in his book, The Righteous Mind. And he's devoted his life to studying how different cultures develop their morality, what they have in common, and how they differ. And from decades of research, he offers five primary pillars of morality that cultures and then subcultures like political parties build off of in varying combinations to produce their morality or collective group conscience that acts as an influence on the people living there. He compares our moral intuitions to how we have five taste buds to detect different flavors. He says humans tend to have five categories for morality that that function like taste buds where we can kind of detect what something is right or wrong. The first one is care and harm. Care and harm. This foundation is exactly what it sounds like. It's protecting individuals from being harmed and wants to prevent pain. The virtues of this foundation are kindness, gentleness, compassion, empathy. The greatest sins here are being cruel, harsh, or insensitive. And we know that something is wrong because you're harming someone. Others are victims of your actions or inactions. So would you say that secular America... Americans tend to care about preventing harm and not creating a victim? Yes, very, very much so. Rightly so. In fact, uh, our our pre-sermon video, uh, most people talked about their moral code involving how to treat others with kindness. Next question would be, does God care about this foundation? And the answer is, of course he does, to a great degree. You shall not murder comes to mind. You shall not bear false witness Those cause harm to people. Second foundation is fairness and cheating. This foundation is concerned with people being treated fairly. It's about justice, rights, and autonomy. The greatest sins here are cheating, deception, or injustice. It goes from racial or ethnic groups being trampled on to a kid taking a toy away from another kid to you beating a vending machine that took your dollar. Anyone done that before? Amen. Would you say that secular Americans tend to care about fairness, justice, and rights? Yes, I would. There are many disagreements when you get down to political parties, with progressives seeing it more as equal outcomes and conservatives seeing it more as equal opportunity, but still overall heavily prioritized. From the Ten Commandments alone, I'd point to, you shall not bear false witness and you shall not steal. Both of those are unjust. In these ways, secular American cultures think, uh, think about morality in, in many ways that God does. And you may be thinking, well, that must be all the categories. It must be all of them. I think we've covered them all. But this is where it starts to pivot and our cultural blind spots may be exposed a little bit more. The third foundation is loyalty and betrayal. Loyalty where you belong to a group or a place and therefore should do things that help the group. This leads to patriotism and group pride and individuals being willing to sacrifice for the good of the group. 
And the greatest sin here is to be a traitor or to be disloyal. Hyde argues in the book that many cultures around the world today think in much more collectivist ways than we do. And by we, I mean majority culture in America, where groups like families, teams, communities, uh, companies, tribes, and nations are more than the sum of the individuals that compose them. And those institutions matter and must be protected. And people have an obligation to play their assigned roles for the good of the group. These cultures have a much higher value for group loyalty than we do. And if you grew up in one of these cultures, odds are you wouldn't ever do anything that put yourself ahead of the group. Doing so would be seen as selfish and foolish, dangerously risking the health and safety of the group. One of our former interns was, uh, had an Asian American cultural background and said that in her culture, it was viewed as wrong for you to not live near your parents. Because as your parents go older, grow older, it's your job to take care of them. And if you don't live near them, you can't take care of them. So would you say that secular Americans tend to care much about loyalty? In general, no. This is not heavily prioritized. In different subgroups where there's like this innate sense of grouping up to survive or thrive, you know, such as the military or some ethnic minorities more so, but in general, it's not very heavily prioritized in secular America. I would actually say we lean more toward teaching people that loyalty is dangerous. We are actually taught that individuals must put themselves ahead of the group because the most important thing in all of life is for you to become the best version of you. And you can't let anyone get in the way of that. This is basically every Disney movie, right? From Moana throwing off the constraints of a small island life to Kung Fu Panda leaving behind the family noodle shop to go become a ninja. It's everywhere. All of the movies that make us cry are about this. It's instilling this in us. From the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Loyalty with God. You shall not commit adultery. Loyalty with your spouse. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Loyalty with community. Sometimes God has more of a value for this than we do. Fourth foundation is authority and subversion. This emphasizes the need for us to forge beneficial relationships within hierarchies, and it insists that hierarchies are both natural and necessary for human flourishing, and not at all necessarily evil. So respect for legitimate authority, whether it be God, a parent, a boss, government, etc., leads to a general respect for traditions and a deference to those above you. The greatest sin here is disrespect, blatant disobedience, or dishonor. Some of our pastors have visited a church in Oakland, California a couple of times, and this church is made up of almost exclusively immigrants from China or South Korea. On the last trip, they noticed that almost no one in the church had TVs. And they had, they had computers and said they would sometimes watch a show on their computer or something, but no one had TVs. And the assumption was that it had, must have been a point of teaching and instruction where they had talked about getting rid of TVs and all the potential problems. But when we asked why they didn't have TVs, they said it was never really talked about. Their pastor has never had a TV and says that he doesn't want the distraction in his life. And they just said that they all just figured if their pastor thought it was a good idea to not have a TV, they wouldn't have one either. They wanted to follow his example and not go against it because the Bible says he's to be an example to the rest of them. So would you say that secular Americans tend to care very much about authority and making sure it's honored? No. No, no, no. Question authority is more the default here. Question everyone. Suspect everyone. If there's a power dynamic at play or any sort of hierarchy, then assume by default it is oppressive. Just as an example of this, one of our pastors was recently invited to a breakout at a conference about workplace trauma and psychological safety. So that's speaking care-harm language. That's showing that we care a lot about care and harm. 
I think many of us would see the title of that breakout and not be surprised at all. But do you think there was a corresponding breakout at that conference titled Suspicion and Distrust of Authority at Work and How It's Destroying Your Organization? No, (laughs) not a chance. If you saw that, you would probably fall over. We take pretty much any authority structure here and place the face of King George on it. We don't like being told what to do. Again, different subgroups have more value for this, but generally speaking, and certainly compared to most other cultures in history, we assume that authority is almost assuredly by default oppressive or maybe even abusive. This is just ingrained in us without even fully realizing it. And you can watch the video mentioned in the book if you want to explore why. And the way I've described this before is that in a culture that prioritizes authority, if there is an issue between a subordinate and a person in authority, they default to thinking the subordinate is wrong. And things can certainly go bad in that direction if you assume that. But on the other side of the spectrum here, if I hear about an issue between someone under authority and someone in authority, I don't even need to know the details. I already have the story filled in. I already assume deep in my bones somehow that the person in authority is wrong. But scripture calls us to respect leaders, to respect civic leaders, spiritual leaders, parents as leaders of the family. The Bible says that leaders must be servant, godly leaders, And that servant leaders should be respected, honored, followed, and dare I say it out loud, submitted to. In the Ten Commandments alone, honor your father and mother. You shall have no other gods before me. Quite the authoritative statements there. And I doubt those are ones that would make the average American's top ten list. And lastly, number five, sanctity or degradation. This foundation claims that some things are right and wrong because there are some things that are sacred. And when I say sacred, I mean that there's this vertical axis where some things are elevated and holy and set apart and sanctified. And below, some things are evil, degrading, and contaminating. The greatest sin here is defilement from doing something evil or degraded. So this foundation argues that the same function of germs is also true about behavior that our behavior can be sick and our disgust response that biologically is designed to keep us from eating rotten or dangerous food also applies to behavior that is vile or contaminating. So a Muslim person will not allow their copy of the Quran to touch the ground because it is holy to them. They are operating from this foundation. They don't want the disease of irreverence to spread. In a worldview built on sanctity, the human body is a temple. It's sacred, and some behaviors are just off limits. And I'm not even going to ask if you think the average American tends to care much about sanctity. The answer is no. Far from seeing the human body as a temple, we see it as a playground. And any society in which 50 shades of gray can actually make money doesn't care about this foundation. This category is nearly a lost language for us. After the commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. God even says the iniquity or spiritual sickness that comes from idol worship is visited on future generations. In other words, it's contagious. Also, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. There's something vile and contaminating about profaning the name of God because of his holiness. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Even a day can be set apart. Our culture has not shaped our consciences to be very concerned with sanctity. So the commandments that deal with it don't really make a lot of sense to us. I could point to verses all over the Bible that you could simply drop into these five buckets, not just in the Ten Commandments. This week, I was literally flipping through the book of Deuteronomy going, there's that one, there's that one, there's that one, down the line. So that's our categories. Everybody still tracking? Everybody with me? Now, I'm going to try to help us see it on the ground a little bit. So each culture and subculture within it, to some degree, each human, builds their sense of morality off some combination of these factors, 
valuing them to much different degrees and deciding when to prioritize one over the other when necessary. And you can see big differences comparing us as a society as a whole to other cultures. But then when you zoom in, you can also see differences, smaller differences between our country. Heights research proves that far left liberals tend to heavily prioritize the first two categories of care and harm and fairness and don't really have much of a category for the others. While far-right conservatives tend to have some concern for all five, but for them, care, harm, and fairness are the absolute lowest concerns of all. And then moderates are some mixture of the two. So last week, we started with the question, is getting the COVID vaccine a personal decision or a moral imperative? And your answer to that is likely influenced by where you lie on the political spectrum. And these categories actually help explain why even COVID is so politically polarized. So liberals care the most about care and harm and want to do whatever it takes to keep people safe. So the more precautions, the better. Far-right conservatives are not as concerned about care and harm. For, for them, from their take on fairness, they argue it isn't fair to make people take a vaccine or wear a mask. It infringes upon our rights. They have a historic fear of being oppressed or controlled by the government. So you see it's care harm on one side and fairness on the other side. Does that make sense? Attitudes about immigration are another example. Liberals driven by more, uh, more by the Care and Harm Foundation are more open to immigration because people who are in harm's way need access to a better life here. Conservatives are more likely to support a border wall out of a sense of loyalty to our nation and argue that we can't let everyone in who wants in. They also value order and want people to respect the laws of our nation. So it's care and harm on one side and loyalty and authority on the other. Still tracking? Last one, just to help us see it on the ground level. A few years ago, NFL players knelt during the national anthem to protest police brutality and racial inequality. Many people supported this as an act of justice and fairness about some things that are long overdue. Others who were more likely to be conservative were offended because they saw it as an act of disrespect to those who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom and rights. For them, the American flag is sacred and the decorum around the national anthem is an institution of our nation that is to be shown respect and deference. So it's fairness on one side and loyalty and sanctity on the other. This shows that people speak different moral languages. So often things you don't understand are built on moral languages that you don't speak or value. But again, my primary purpose here is to help you see this with God. We are not moral relativists. I'm not trying to make the argument that we should all just get along and sing Kumbaya although getting along wouldn't actually hurt that much. It'd be kind of nice. But I'm trying to help us see how this works with how we approach God, because when there's something God says in Scripture that you simply don't understand, a likely explanation is that God has different moral categories than you have. When you look at the Ten Commandments, and certain ones just don't feel as important to you, a likely explanation is that God has more categories for morality and human flourishing than you do. And if you can have the humility to zoom out and see that, Lord willing, you will end by seeing how wise he is. Which brings us back to the uh, street video from earlier. In modern Western life, to a great degree, care harm has become the primary lens through which we think about right and wrong, and sometimes the only lens. We are all autonomous individuals, free to live out our lives however we want, and if it doesn't hurt anyone, then it must not be wrong. If it does hurt someone, then it likely is wrong. And we have all sorts of language and understanding for this. And on the flip side, we have a greatly reduced understanding of sanctity or purity, that some things are holy and others are degrading, even if I can't point to a victim, it hurts. It's almost like the foundation of sanctity is a bit like a lost language for us. And all we are left to think about is whether or not actions create victims. That's the only category we have. And we see evidence of this everywhere. Something that has happened more times than we'd like to say is that 
A couple would come in for premarital counseling who were on the fringe of our church or sometimes even core members. And we would find out that they are either living together or frequently sleeping together. And we'd open the Bible and show them why this is not acceptable for Christians. And frequently they would say the exact same thing. We just don't understand who it is hurting. In other words, I'm familiar with the category of care and harm, but I really don't know how something could be wrong otherwise. I don't have any other categories to think about this. That's actually what was happening there. We've had people come to us and say some version of, how could God tell someone who they can and cannot have sex with? Who is it hurting? The first major pastoral care issue we dealt with after starting Lexington was a couple here who claimed to be Christians, but also were swingers. And they could not wrap their minds around how what they were doing was hurting anyone. So they walked away from God and our church. And this idea came full circle a few years ago when at a college retreat at our downtown church, a college life group leader walked up to one of our pastors and said, hey, is cannibalism sinful? A bunch of students were discussing it and they couldn't verbalize a reason for it to be wrong or sinful because there was not a victim that it was hurting. And our pastor was like, So it made us realize that we have to get underneath all of this and talk about what foundations we're basing our morality on. We have some cultural blind spots that are causing us to miss some really important categories if we can't condemn cannibalism, amen? It's kind of like trying to build a house, but the only tool you have is a level. That's gonna be a really straight house, but you don't wanna live in it. I'm doing all this work here because I know what's coming in this series, and I, I know we have a wide range of where people are spiritually that interact with our church, and I know what's coming as we start talking about the Ten Commandments, and I want to lay a foundation first that helps explain why some of them may feel confusing to you or just unimportant to you, or maybe why you don't even like them. And at the end of the series, our prayer is that a few things would happen. One, that you'd be less confused about the Bible, and in your Bible reading, when you come across something that seems confusing or maybe even problematic to you, that you would go, oh, this is speaking a moral language that is not familiar to me. Let me get outside of my home morality and see this how God sees it. Two, that we'd have less friction or tension with God's moral vision and that our consciences would be more aligned with his in any ways that they may be off. And three, that we would stand in awe of the wisdom of God that spans geography and time and have our affections for his design grow because we see more and more clearly that he is for our good always. So as we end today, I have a request and then I have some good news. Here's my request. If you would say that there are parts of the Bible that you don't like or disagree with, if that's you, can I just give you one thing to think about? Just one thing for this series as we talk through some of God's commands for human uh, flourishing and why he gives those commands. I'm gonna put this all the way on the bottom shelf here if you'll bear with me. My humble request is that if only for this series, would you give God the same respect you would give to a personal trainer at your gym. That's, that's the request. Because if you're at the gym and you start doing something and your trainer walks up and says, that might feel right, but it's actually really wrong. And if you keep doing it that way, you're gonna bust your back. You would say, oh, well, how should I be doing it? And you would open yourself up to correction and redirection because you know when it comes to working out, your trainer is smarter than you. 
If you're not a Christian, of course, what I want for you is to trust and follow Jesus and become a Christian, but I'm not even talking about that right now. I'm just asking that for a few weeks here, you treat God like you would a personal trainer and give him the benefit of the doubt and at least consider that he might know more than you. That there could possibly be times where something seems right to you, but in fact, it's very wrong. Or times where something seems wrong to you, but in fact, is very right. So my humble request is that you'd be willing to at least hear God out. And if you ask me, that's a very reasonable request, right? I think all my requests are reasonable, so. I don't know that my wife would agree, but. Now for the good news. An expanded, holistic view of God's law actually makes me realize that I am wrong and sinful and off in more ways than I previously thought. It exposes my blind spots. Just after the passage we started with in uh, Romans 3, Paul says this is exactly what is supposed to happen. This is Romans 3 verse 19. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who were under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. When I read this verse, I, I picture all of these nations all over the world with their broken by sin metal detector consciences coming together as a group to try to crowdsource a sense of morality for their culture, speaking confidently as if we've finally found it. But Paul says, when the perfect law of God comes, every mouth will be stopped. That includes the mouth of Western secularism here today. All of our thoughts about right and wrong, affected by sin and our culture, are ultimately hushed by God's law. And his wise, well-rounded, perfect law confronts all of us all over the world, different ways in each culture, but forcefully and clearly everywhere. And if you're thinking, wait, this isn't good news, here it comes. Verse 20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. None of us will ever live up to God's perfect law. And I would bet as we go through this series that some of us will be like, man, I break law, God's law in ways I didn't even realize. I sin against him in culturally acceptable ways that don't seem like a big deal to me. All of us have sinned and fallen short of this beautiful moral vision more than we know. But the good news for those of us in Christ is that he perfectly obeyed in our place, amen? Amen. The spotless, blemish-free righteousness of the Son of God covers us as a robe of righteousness. So we have been justified or made right with God by trusting in faith that His grace alone can make us righteous. And God also has sent His Spirit to dwell within us, to convict us and lead us to righteousness, as the book of John says. So he not only saved us, but he also comes alongside us to supernaturally help us to follow Jesus, to align our broken consciences with God's perfect law, which is exactly what we're hoping happens during this series. So we need not be overwhelmed because our righteousness does not come from us. And also because God himself comes alongside us to even live within us, to help us obey him in all of the ways that we need it. Let's pray.